All right, something cool here is with Alicia Taylor. How you doing? Good, good. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure. How are you? I'm doing good, good. How's things on your end? Busy, busy, but all good things. Can't complain. Now, let's talk about the cherry bombs. I have to say it is the perfect combination of beauty and danger. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, your shows go all out with death defying acts. How did you go from a basic dance troupe to the show that you have today? Uh, well, we always had aspects of aerial and fire since the beginning of our show, um, since the beginning of its inception. And um, as the years went on, we just progressively took that and just grew it bigger and bigger and added more. So, you know, I mean, for adrenaline junkies like myself, you're always kind of pushing the limit and trying new things and seeing what else you can do without killing yourself. <laughs> just, you know, there's kind of a, an excitement that comes with trying new things and making them happen that maybe you haven't seen done before. Now there are other dance troops out there, but how did you build yourself up to be the premier rock and roll troop? You know, I think it just was kind of a, the perfect marriage of having um incredible talent in my team my team is i mean they're beyond talented they're just incredible athletes they're incredible performers um and they're always working on themselves they're always growing their craft so having that kind of um initiative to not get complacent in what you do in your artistry and always push to to do bigger and better things and do them better um is is the first aspect and then the second part of it i think is coming up with things outside of the box, coming up with new, um, you know, acts and new skills and, and kind of carving our own way um, and, and showing the audience new things that hasn't really been done before. So really the imagination part of it. And I think having those two things combined can make you a really unstoppable force when it comes to this sort of thing. And that's what we've done. Now, does it ever get overwhelming, not only being the star of the cherry bombs, but running every aspect of the troop? Yes, I desperately need an assistant. So if you know anybody, <laughs> please send them my way. Um, it's very overwhelming. Not only, you know, running it, running the business, running the merchandise, uh, you know, managing it. But I also have, you know, a team that I have to be responsible for. I also do the production side of it. Um, I, you know, have a heavy hand in all the wardrobe. I don't actually make it myself anymore. I used to, um, there are some things I'm able to delegate now, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but uh, yeah, it is absolutely 1000% overwhelming. I need, I wish I had three of me to be able to do this. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it definitely has to be a lot of work. I mean, it's, you know, especially with the girls, I mean, not only are you your friend, but you're also their boss. So it's gotta be a, a double sided sword there. And that, you know, that has taken me years to learn uh, how to navigate that because that in itself is kind of an art form. And, you know, having a boss and friend relationship with people, and I think a lot of people can relate to this with either their bosses or if they're the boss themselves, um, there has to be boundaries. There has to be healthy boundaries there. There has to be, first and foremost, there has to be respect on both ends. So I have to respect them not only as you know my employee but also as their own human and their own person and and my friend when it calls so um you know we do a really good job now of when we're in the studio um and we're at work i am their boss and it, nothing is personal because i think in the beginning it was really hard I, when i was friends with a lot of these these performers if i would give them a correction or have to crack down on them for something they would take it very personally. Like my friend is, you know, yelling at me or upset at me or whatever. And no, no um, that's not it at all. It's just, it's just, I, I have to do this as, as the leader of this brand. I have to, I wouldn't be a good leader if I didn't uh, follow through on some of these things. So uh, explaining that to everybody and making sure that everybody's well aware and there's open communication both ways um, is, is a big part of it. And, and, uh, uh, I'm very thankful in that I have a team where the respect is very mutual. And um, yeah, we just we function like a well-oiled machine now. now. Have you ever had a dancer that had just had it all too much to handle? I mean, you know, not only are you guys a troupe, but you guys are going on tour with some of the biggest bands in the world and playing huge festivals and things. 
Yeah. Um, you know, with any band or any other group, um, it is absolutely a team effort. It is a team, right? Um, so everybody has to pull their weight. Everybody has to look out for one another. And if somebody is, you know, down for whatever reason, we all have to come together to help her come back up. So, um, you know, the ones that don't last long in my group are the ones that don't pull their weight from the beginning, uh, who are kind of one foot in, one foot out. They're not very dedicated or uh, maybe they're in it for the wrong reasons um, and they're not willing to do the hard work that comes with it. Because like any act or band even, what you see on stage or what you hear on an album is the finished product. What you're, you're not seeing or not hearing is the hours of practice or the work that it takes to go into all those things to make that final product happen. So um, if you're not willing to do all the, the not so fun stuff, um, then you're not going to last long. And I'm going to, I'm going to pick up on that really quick. And unfortunately uh, you probably won't be lasting long with me. Now, who was the first band that you went on tour with and how did you get that gig? The first band we went on an actual national tour with was Buck Cherry and Blackstone Cherry. And we got that gig because I, I had cold emailed an agent out of the blue. And I was like, hi, you don't know who I am. You don't know who the cherry bombs are, but trust me, this is awesome. And I sent them all of our stuff. And I got a call about a week later and the agent said, you know, I've been looking for an act that has the name Cherry. In it. <laughs> and he goes, the universe, he goes, I've been scouring the internet for a group with the name Cherry in it, a band really. And here you are just in my inbox. And he's like, the universe gives. And I was like, yeah, totally. And then he, I don't think he cared who we were or what we did or what we didn't do. He was just like, done, let's do it. And um, I found that out because when we went to go put the tour together with the, with the tour manager and we were advancing everything, tour manager looks at me and he's like, don't you guys like go-go dance to house music or something? And I was like, no, I was like, no, we are, we're like a show. Like we have an actual show. And he's like, no one told me this and I don't have time for you. I don't have time for you in, on this tour. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to follow you around in a van with five other women around the country to go, go dance during house music. Okay. Like, I'm just, I love you, but I'm not going to do that. He was like, okay, well, listen, you get a 15 minute set, you get a 12 minute set and you get a five minute set. And I'm going to be the one to tell you which set you do on each show day. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> at this point I was like, beggars can't be choosers, right? Like I'm going to take every opportunity that I can Fine, five minutes. That'll be the best fucking five minutes you've ever seen in your life. Let's go. And yeah. And I, you know, we did it, we made it happen. And, and that's kind of what we've led with and through our whole you know, career in cherry bombs is like, okay, we're going to take anything that we can get any opportunity that we can get. That's fine. If it's a shitty opportunity, we'll still take it. I don't care. Just set me up and we're going to knock it out of the park every time. And we just go into every show, no matter how big or how small or how this or how that. And we, we lead it with that. Now, I know you did some shows this year. What was it like to get back out there and start performing again? It was really good, man. It was, um, it was really, really rad. And it's, um, you know, it made me appreciate what I do, the performing. It made me appreciate live music. It made me appreciate live entertainment. You know, these past two years have been so brutal for all of us. It's not just, you know, us in the industry where this is our livelihood, but also fans and concert goers and audience members. Like, we've all missed this so much because it's, there's something about a live, show that can really feed your soul in a way that not many other experiences can, right? There's this magic moment in between uh, an audience and a performer where there's an exchange of energy. And there's just something really unique about that, that we really haven't had much of uh, the past two years. So um, to be able to see it come back and make it happen and, and start bringing it back is, is something that you know, is, is I'm very grateful for, absolutely. Now, what made you decide you wanted to document your career and uh, start filming the uh, the Girl Gang series? Well, um, there was just a lot of mayhem going on behind the scenes 
uh, in cherry bombs, as as you guys see when you watch this. Um, there's just so much more to what we do than than what meets the eye, I think. And I wanted to kind of give people who were curious about us because it is it's not a new concept. What I do, there's been many groups before me. Um, it's not a new concept, but I would say that it's a concept that hasn't really been brought to as big of an audience as it is now. And so the last thing I wanted was people just to look at us on stage and be like, oh, these girls, they're just up there shaking their ass and there's nothing to this and, and they have it easy. And, and I wanted to show the dedication and the work that goes into the background of it and be able to highlight my performers and, and what they do and their unique contributions to this, to making this show that looks so easy come to life for them. And that was really kind of the main goal with that. Um, also too, you know, we're not a man, so we don't have albums, right? We don't have like singles that we can put out or things to reach audiences over streaming. So to me, Girl Gang was also a business move in that I'm able to reach fans across the world via YouTube um, and kind of have something to give them in between performances or when we're not on the road. Um, that kind of uh, is just more content to give you guys since we're not, you know, making music, we're making, we're making this, we're making entertainment is what we're making. You see, that's one thing I really enjoy about it is it really does show all the aspects of how hard it is to actually do these shows. I mean, from rehearsal and training and, and getting ready and doing stuff and all the drama that goes through with dealing with people <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, it is, man. It's wild. And, and not to mention, too, you know, we're in a male dominated industry. So there, I, as much as we want to deny and deny there, you'd be I'd be lying if I said that there isn't a difference in you know, being a woman in this industry and having to kind of gain that respect from your peers um, it is just a different kind of, of thing to navigate for us. So, and, and not to mention, not only are we women, but we're at times scandally clad. So there's that extra layer um, of perception that we're kind of challenging people with, right? So that's another kind of purpose of Girl Gang is that it's so easy, I think, to see women who are in bras and underwears or burlesque outfits or whatever it is and go, oh, she's this, she's that. But Girl Gang really gives you a human aspect to the performers and the brand and who we are as individuals that, you know, there's more to us than that. And maybe we aren't what you originally thought we were. Um, so it kind of gives people a chance to get to know us and come around if they if they kind of um, shut us off because of their of their perceived notions of us or what they thought we were. Now, one of the things you talked about on this season is the trouble you're dealing with getting permits. I mean, not only for COVID to prove that you guys are healthy and able to tour, but things like fire and certain rigs that you have. Yeah, that was a unique situation. Um, I've actually never been put in that situation before. Um, generally, you don't have to pull like city permits for things that are self-contained that you own, that you're setting up, um, that you break, you set up and you break down on your own and they're like barricaded off. So that was, that was a really unique situation for me. Um, but that also kind of shows you how limited, you know, some of these people in our industry that we have to work with, um, their knowledge is in regards to what we do, because um, a lot of time, the biggest challenge is getting a lot of these venues to just read our writer. That's the hardest thing because they think we're a band. So they're like, oh, we're going to have to blah. And then they're, and then they look at it and they go, oh shit, fire? Like, wait a minute, rigging? Like, what's this? And I'm like, you have to read the writer. You just have to. <laughs> and uh, we break it all down for you so that there should be no surprises when we arrive. And yet that still happens, as you can see from Girl Gang. Um, but, you know, we navigate it the best we can and we try and work with, with, uh, with what we can and if they're open to to learning from us and if they're opening to listening to us and our education and our knowledge as to what we do and they feel safe because that's really what this comes down to right like liability and feeling safe about things because safe is a feeling um then then we're good but if they don't feel safe about something it doesn't matter what data we show them what knowledge we're bringing to the table it, it won't happen at all whatsoever now, I know with COVID came around, a lot of venues closed down and there's a lot of new ones popping up. So some of the places you might have been used to are no longer there. 
Has there ever been a mm. circumstance where you've gone to a new club and just didn't feel safe about doing your full performance with fire and stuff? We we try and uh, hedge that off by advancing our shows. Um, so when I do an advancing call with the venues, um, you know, I ask for photos of the inside of the venue, a video if they can take it when they're walking around um, so I can see, you know, what's in place and what I need to do what I do. Um, I do a lot of Googling. Um, I ask a lot of questions. And so we try and get as much information about a venue as possible before we walk in the door. Um, now, that's not always uh, the case. Sometimes the information is incorrect. Sometimes the information is not there at all. Sometimes I can't get anybody on the phone. So we kind of have to go into a venue with an open mind. And the first thing I do at load in, you know, at noon, when we can get into the venue is uh, myself and my aerialist or whoever else I have in charge will walk into a venue. And the first thing we start doing is looking at the ceilings. Okay, you know, where are we going to hang? And we look at the structure of everything and, and make sure it's safe. If for some reason, you know, we have been in this situation where I've looked at something and I'm like, nope, this is not safe. We are not hanging on it. And some big guy, you know, will hang off of it and be like, well, look, I can do it. So you're good. And we're like, no, that's <laughs> not how this works at all. Um, uh, then I just, I, I scratch it. Um, before in the early days, we would work around it and just, I would start editing music really fast and cut that part of the show and we just make it happen. These days, uh, we're a little more particular and a little more stubborn, if you will, in that, um, you know, it's, it's in our contract, it's part of our advancing process. If, if this venue isn't able to meet me in the middle on these things and it cannot happen, we don't book a show there and we don't announce a show there. Um, so because it, to me, it's, it's unfair to not give our audience, you know, you see videos of us on YouTube and right. you're like, I want to see that. I want to see that. For and sure. then you come and it's the equate version of the cherry bomb show and it's not what you thought it was going to be it's watered down it's 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 just not what you expected and and that to me feels like a disservice to the fans um or the people who are curious as to who we are oh yeah but plus it could be a turnoff i mean if people see you for the first time and it wasn't what they it thought is. it is you know exactly or, or i mean i've seen this right i've seen people look at our photos and go that's photoshop <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. I mean, come out and see what it actually goes through, you know? Yeah, but if we're not doing it for them in person, then why wouldn't they say that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, I know it's a lot of places the uh, the mandates are starting to end in certain states and counties and stuff throughout the country. Is that making it easier yeah. for you to uh, tour? Um, yeah, I think it, it does make it a little... I don't know. It's kind of six in one hand, half dozen in the other, right? So on one hand, it makes it easier because more crowds are willing to come out. They want to buy tickets and whatever. But on the other side, you know, it, it's a potential, um, you know, if this virus, you know, it seems I'm, I'm, look, I'm not a doctor. I don't claim to be a doctor. I don't claim to know more than anyone else about this stuff. So I'm not just going to preface this by saying that, um, you know, there's still a risk about getting sick. And, and with this, virus if one person in your camp gets sick it kind of shuts everything down you have to stop um and that's one thing we know to be true about it so um you know reducing the risk as much as possible and, and in my camp and what we do we're all about reducing the risk as much as possible because th these are all, ca all calculated risks we're all aware that there is a chance people can get sick there is a chance that people can get hurt um you know whatever then we just go about it in the way that we we're comfortable with and uh we just make sure that to do our best that's all we can really do is just do our best make sure everybody's healthy yeah i mean it's definitely got to be scary out there i mean it just went from covid 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 to all of a sudden it's done mask are done <laughs> everything's done go ahead and live your life i mean which <sighs> everyone wants to do but it, there's a lot of risk still involved if I wish I knew a method to the madness right now, I just, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. Well, I'm like, okay, we're going to do right. this now. That's fine. That's I, and it's pretty easy going, you know, like if I have to wear a mask, I'm, I'm cool. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, I, that's not the hill I'm going to die on. There are much worse things in, in life that I've had to deal with than putting a mask on my face. So I'm okay with that. Um, 
that doesn't bother me at all. And, you know, I just, I'm just going to, I'm just trying to go along with whatever, you know, is happening. And I'm just trying to do what I do and do it well. That's all I'm, I'm really concerned about. So. Right. Now yeah. I see you have a big, big festival set up and then you're going to do uh, overseas one with your husband. Is that right? We are. Yeah. We, uh, we've got some Danny Wimmer festivals coming up. We've got Louder Than Life. We've got Aftershock Festival. Uh, before that, we're going to be in Florida uh, at a horror convention called Spookala in Ocala, Florida. And um, and then, yeah, off to the UK in October, uh, which will be our first time traveling to the UK. I'm super excited about that. So we're doing uh, a couple dates out there, not not a ton. Um, and then, you know, who knows? We may, maybe we'll add some more show dates on the, on the end of that for Cherry Bombs and see if we can stay out there. Because I would love to stay out there and just keep doing the Europe circuit. Cause I think for what we do, uh, the European market would be, would be really good for us. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I notice a lot more rock and roll things get a lot of attention overseas more than they get here for some reason. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I was talking with an agency over there and I was kind of trying to explain to them how their, their audiences are different than us here in the States, you know, and, and I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because maybe us here in the States, we have all these acts that count that are all around. So maybe we're a little spoiled. Um, whereas in the UK, when an American rock band comes over there, it's a really big deal because it's not as often. Um, so I, that's kind of one theory, but I, the audiences in Europe and they're just, they're, man, they go ham over there. They are a different level. They're like the Latin American fans too. They're right. super passionate, super passionate. Yeah. And it's really cool. Now, it has to be pretty cool that you get to go on tour with your husband. I mean, he seems like a very busy guy. If you ain't doing Slipknot at solo stuff or Comic Cons or something like that. So yeah. for you being able to do a show with him, it's got to be at least you get to spend some time with him. Yeah, I, it, it is. It, it's kind of um, the best of both worlds. Like I get to do what I love. He gets to do what he loves and we could do it together, which is, I mean, we love doing everything together. We're like best friends. You know, we're running around you know, watching movies and running errands. And we just love to be around each other. Um, and so to be able to do the thing you love with the person you love is a, is a very unique and very, um, very fun opportunity. So um, I'm very thankful for that. And I hope he likes it as much as I do, because I have a blast. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a really cool thing. It's like Tim McGraw and Faith Hill, you know, doing their thing. There you go all the time yeah we love to do our thing every time so um yeah and if you're a couple that can stand to be around each other like that some couple i understand some couples can't they're like oh god if i were to work with my husband or wife and oh but we love it we just we have a blast now when you guys are both so record recognized is it hard for you guys to go out on your free time and do like normal stuff um sometimes it, it depends on where we are um, sometimes it's hard to like have date night, you know, go out to dinner, um, and stuff like that. Usually when we're with the kids, people are respectful and, and kind of like hang back a little bit. Um, but honestly, I would say getting work done at the house is more challenging <laughs> 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 because people will come over and like deliver something or work on something on the house and then all of a sudden I'll catch them like taking pictures of our house and stuff which I think is kind of creepy um so that's that's a little weird but now, now when you guys are on the road together do you have any extra pressure that you feel to uh to do a fantastic show I mean what I mean by that is like you're established you guys do amazing work but some people might say oh you're only on this tour because that's your husband Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, nepotism. Yeah, that is absolutely, absolutely. Um, I do feel that pressure. Um, you know, especially with like not fest LA, that was a big, big one. Um, and I felt like with not fest LA that I needed to pull out as many stops as I could to really fill that massive stage and kind of earn our spot there, you know, prove that, we do, we do deserve to be here. And, and, you know, I've said this before publicly, but, you know, the first person to suggest that we do not best was Jim Root. 
uh, this is way before Corey and I, Jim Root uh, saw us perform years and years ago. And he was like, you girls should be on Not Fest. And he was the first one to ever, to ever mention that. So people, a lot of people don't know that. Um, and then when we got the invite to go on Not Fest LA, Clown was the one who actually asked if we could do that one. So Corey knows how I feel about it. I'm really weird about uh, him asking for things for me or him speaking or up for me, or I, I really ask him, I'm like, please don't like, please don't suggest me for anything. Please don't, um, you know, help me with anything or get anything, you know what I mean? Or, because I don't feel that makes me feel like I didn't earn it. And I don't want anybody to feel weird about having to answer to him or feel like they have to do something because he said it. So if anybody, you know, if we ever get anything, I want it to be organic and I want it to be genuine. Um, and I don't want it to be because of a favor or anything like that. Oh, I could, I could definitely see how hard that is. I mean, Corey's the type of guy that can go ahead and say, Hey, you know, it's raining out and it's going to be on the, the headlines of a million different websites because it's something that he said, you know? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, what he says will always most likely turn into a headline for sure. But you are definitely an established act on your own. I mean, the stuff that you girls do is completely uh, amazing. And I'm, you know, I'm great to see that you guys are pushing through and becoming the success that you are on your own. Well, thank you. That means a lot. Um, we really, really try and just give the best show that we can with all the circumstances surrounding it, um, if there are any. And we just want to give a really unique, entertaining memory to music that maybe you already have a connection with or music that you already love we just want to give you a unique experience um and so you know hopefully this thing keeps going for a long time and even beyond me and and it lives and breathes on its own so that would be that would be the dream you know i read that the pussycat dolls were one of your inspirations uh, have you ever considered doing any original music with the cherry bombs yes the reason why, oh, oh, you mean like as, as in singing, like the Pussycat Dolls, the band? Because right. the Pussycat Dolls, the Pussycat Dolls started out as their own burlesque troupe that were just mm -hmm. dancers. And they sang too, but they weren't like the pop group as most people know them to be. Um, so in regards to becoming like a singing musical act, no, not in that way. Um I have an idea, and I think the next frontier of Cherry Bombs will be to incorporate um, original music into our show and then have a live band play it and you still get the same show. But I don't want to turn Cherry Bombs into the Pussycat Dolls where, you know, five girls are out there singing um, every song or anything like that. And now it's like a band. Um, I think what makes Cherry Bombs cool is that it's not that. I think what, I think what makes Cherry Bombs cool is that it is strictly dancing and circ arts and it's its own different thing because i've had so many you know potential managers come to me and say you guys should all sing you guys should all do that you guys should all be pussycat dolls and you should all sing but i think that's they would suggest that because that's what they know and that's been done before so i kind of like the challenge of doing this and because it hasn't been done before yeah, I could definitely see that taking away from your uniqueness too, though. I mean, if you girls yeah. started coming out there and like trying to all bust out a tune, it wouldn't be as cool as seeing some of the stuff that you guys do. Right. Then we would be compared to the Pussycat Dolls the entire time. So then we would just be Pussycat Dolls like this, this way. So, um, you know, I use the term Pussycat Dolls to describe us for people who have no idea what we are, because it's the closest thing I can think of in terms of the dancing, not right. singing, because we don't sing, right? So what I try and explain to people is like, if you were to take like the Pussycat Dolls as the dancing part of it, and then Cirque du Soleil and put it together, that's what Cherry Bombs is. Um, but I'm kind of hoping to build this brand so that when people go and do something, they say, it's like the Cherry Bombs, but it's this. Now, one thing I've seen you do is step up some of your theatrics and you did your macabre show mm -hmm. yeah you said it right that was uh that was pretty cool i like the way you put everything together instead of just having like 
you girls come out and dance to, you know, here's some Rob Zombie or here's some ministry or something like that. That was, you know, an actual mm -hmm. show you got to see. It was pretty cool. How'd you come up with that idea? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, we used to do our shows as a set, like how a band does a set, right? So it's like song, 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 and just one after the other. And that's kind of it. And we had always done our shows that way. And I thought, I want to do something different. What if I, what if we did a storyline and it was still song after song, but the songs fit the storyline and it was a production, not a far cry from like a Broadway or a ballet production, but it took you through the whole storyline from beginning to end and every part had intention and everything was interwoven to tell this story. Um, so that to me was kind of the next um, frontier in, in Cherry Bombs and their evolution. So I wrote the story in 2019 and I wanted it to be kind of a horror story. And it's about this guy. And this is also the first time I brought in a male performer. And I brought, I wrote it for, to be this guy character who is driving in his car and he breaks down in the middle of nowhere and he goes into the saloon. And in the saloon, he's trying to find his way out. And at the end of the story, you figure out, does he escape the saloon or does he end up, you know, being a permanent fixture of it forever and all time? So it's kind of like a, you know, like a honey pot, like a honey trap. And um, it's, it's really Dust Till Dawn meets Dante's Inferno, kind of a mishmash of that together. If like Quentin Tarantino and Rob Zombie were to direct it, but a production put on by like Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's really cool. Now, do you ever think about expanding on that idea and maybe like filming it for the fans to see? We did. So during 2020, so I wrote that story long in 2019, right before the pandemic was even a thing. And I was, and we had, we're booked on our headlining run. And I was like, this is the show that we're going to perform on our headlining run. We were scheduled to do that in spring of 2020. And then of course COVID hit. And remember back when we were like, oh, this is going to be four weeks. This is going to be like two months. Okay. When this is over in three months, we're going to all go back to this. We were saying these things, right? And I thought during this weird, you know, month, two month, three month period where we thought COVID was going to be over kind of quickly. I said, well, our, our headlining run got canceled because of this, but what if we film like an extended trailer version of this storyline? And that way we can pump that out to the fans and get them really excited so that when COVID is over and we do our headlining run in the summer of 2020, uh, we'll be ready to go. And now we've promoted it. And so my team all got together and we started filming it. And as we started filming it, like things weren't really ending. Like we thought they were going to end and it kept getting extended and extended. And I looked at my videographer and I was like, this, we're going to have to film this entire show as a movie, like a full blown, the full thing as a movie. And he lives in Atlanta. So, and I'm in Las Vegas. So he was like, let's do it. And so we shot Cabaret as a film, as its own cinematic adventure, if you will uh over covid and then we debuted it as a live stream uh new years of 2021 and uh sold tickets to it and now we're going to make that an annual kind of uh, feature every october since it's kind of a halloween -y story uh we'll go ahead and live stream it every october annually for people to see um in cinematic form oh that's awesome yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a cool thing to, to break off on, too. Yeah, thank you. It, and again, uh, just like Girl Gang, it was a way for us to reach fans all over the world in a time where there was no performing, there was no nothing. So it, it kind of gave us purpose, um, you know, during a very uncertain time for our industry. Now, besides the festivals and the uh, overseas shows that you have, do you have any other plans for touring the summer? Um, I do, but I can't say them yet. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping to be busy. Now, the one thing I've seen that you girls do is when you do a meet and greet, not only do you give something to the fans, but you also donate to a homeless shelter too. Is that right? So um, we partnered up with a company called Crew Socks. And what we did is we created a cherry bomb sock, actual cherry bomb sock. I think I have them around here somewhere. And um, 
for every pair of socks that we sell, we donate a pair to the Nevada Homeless Alliance. So um, I discovered that, you know, socks are one of the most requested things for amongst homeless people. And Crew Socks already does that. Like their whole platform and in, in their sock company is that they give back to those in need whenever you purchase their socks. So that was kind of their um, their whole method anyways. And so when they came to me and said like, can we do a cherry bomb sock? I said, oh my God, yes, that's great. And I love what you guys are doing and that you give back and you're doing this charity. And they said, yeah, we'll pick a charity and, and let's do it. And said, okay. So we designed the sock and you know, the first batch we were able to donate 250 socks. And I haven't done a recount of the next batch that we've sold. So after I hit a certain amount, then I like to donate them in, in big chunks. And, um, and, and yeah, that's what we do. Uh, it's just our little way of giving back through our merchandise right now. That's awesome. Now, for those that are watching, they want to follow up. They want to check you girls out, see what shows you guys are going to be playing. They want to watch Girl Gang. Is there a, a main place platform for them to go to? Yeah, you can go to our website it's cherrybombs.co so cherrybombs.co and that's our website where we have all of our tour dates our store um links to all of our socials you can find us at cherry bombs official on instagram and facebook um yeah and we're on tiktok as well on cherry bombs official and yeah we're just on youtube the cherry bombs i think it's cherry bombs official is our youtube channel and yeah you can find us anywhere and everywhere Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you. I really hope that I get an opportunity to check you girls out somewhere in my neck of the woods this summer. And uh, yeah. I wish you the best going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Take care of yourself. Thank you. You too.